In this video, I'm going to focus information on how to look for the pattern for the people that are looking for the pattern and the template, the seekers that are uh, looking for the, the deeper picture, not just the answer. This video is for you. My name is Dan Paulson, everyone else. Welcome to the channel. And there is a template that was identified by Joseph Campbell, the hero's journey that has been further identified as a self healing template. And that is what we're looking for right here. This emerges in all religions, myths, and spiritual teachings from antiquity. And that includes Judaism, Christianity, Hinduism, Buddhism. And that's what, that's what this video is going to be about. What I'm going to do is kind of step into a new realm. I've been really focused on shorter verses, the Lao Tzu, Buddha, Jesus verses that are very condensed. It's, it's one teaching style. It's like a genre of teaching that are very condensed, very compressed verses. Those That teaching, though, can stretch into something that becomes a, a myth. Greek and Roman mythology contain this, uh, this template. And Hinduism, Judaism, Christianity, they all contain this template as well. There's a basic teaching that I'm going after. So let me caveat something that I need to say right up front, that I don't know all of those religions extensively. Some of them I know fairly well. I didn't go through any courses to learn mythology or anything like that. Um, my study has been more independent, but there's a, there's a point where as I'm recognizing this template, I am now as I'm looking at material, I am no longer trying to learn what that religion is. I'm trying to spot that template. There's a point when I see that, that I realize, oh, that's what is in here. What that means, for example, if I see that this self-healing teaching is in Jesus's material, and then I see from my position that they've taken Jesus's material, and from that they've created Christianity, which is an elaborate version of a package to carry Jesus's teachings, to take them far and wide, I don't feel like in order to understand Jesus's teachings, I start by trying to learn Christianity. That's a downstream teaching that is a package to carry what is in there. I think we can see that at some point when you're, when you're turning inward and going, I want to know what Jesus teaches. You stop listening to what people tell you about, uh, well, you know what I mean? There, there's a, there's a point where it changes for you. I look at other material the same way. I'm going to do something today from the Bhagavad Gita. We're going to look at some parts, some component parts that we're going to recognize not only there, but also I will transition a little bit and show you where those also exist in some Jewish teachings. But I want to start there because it's kind of a safe place to go. But I, I will tell you, I can't pronounce things right. I'm going to skip some things that I will show you on there because I just can't pronounce them correctly. Um, there are names and things like that that I'm, that I'm going to cover, though. I'm going to talk about them extensively. I've just been criticized before from Indians for not saying things exactly right. And I, I realize that I don't know the language and some of it is uh, very foreign to me. And I mispronouncing them is not an issue to me. I know what those names exist for. And I think that mispronouncing them is a non-issue, but uh, I, I don't want to sound too clumsy. So <laughs> I, I'll let you know that ahead of time. Okay. So as you start reading these stories, I noticed that a lot more parts come into play. There's, there's a lot of information there that is kind of fun to look for. And I always want to encourage that we try to leave our modern biases behind and understand that 2000 years ago, they have our brains and no technology. These stories are their technology. So we're not just looking at simple little things here. Um, imagine sitting, imagine having no way to connect with any, anybody, anywhere, any way. You got oil light at home. If you, if you have oil, <laughs> that's your technology. These stories will be big, a big deal, a huge deal. We treat them today like they're simple little things that we would come up with and don't understand the complexity of them. So that's important. They're very complex stories. There's a lot nested in here. All right. The first thing I want to do is pop up a hero's journey template right here. We'll just take a look at one. We're at the top right there. Um, that would be position one, start to, or a call to adventure. We've got supernatural aid right there and we have threshold and guardian or guardians there. There is beginning of transformation. This is just one example. You can find a variety of these if you look. 
they're all going to kind of work the same way, but we will see component parts of them emerge. Even though there's variations in them, there's flexibility in the way they work. They're all going to be functioning internally in the same way. So bear in mind that these are appearing in different cultures, different places, and they're being um, constructed by people uh, thousands of miles and sometimes thousands of years apart from each other but they're still building on this template. This is what we're going to look for right here uh, as we get into it today. And I'm going to be using just chapter one in the Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita is part of a, a collection, the Mahabharata. It's actually a huge collection of Indian works that I'm not going to get into. I don't know it very well, like I said, but it, th this, this right here has lessons in it. That is a, it's a, I, I like looking at it. It's, it's a chunk that some people say it's like the uh, the Sermon on the Mount or something like that. But the Sermon on the Mount is very short verses. This actually gets into the more extensive version of what happens when you construct that teaching into a fun story to, to send around. We're going to extract the same things from there. But in here, we're going to start to spot that pattern. And the way it, oh, okay, the way it works is that two people are, starting off in this Krishna and Arjuna and let me do it this way I'm going to read it to begin with I'll glaze over I'll, I'll talk to you about the spots that I'm going to skip the names but we're going to talk about what they're doing I just won't try to pronounce the names to I'd fumble at it um, well I'll talk through that part though and show you everything we won't we won't leave it untouched we're not going to glaze over it we'll know it thoroughly we just won't know how to pronounce the names uh, yeah, we'll get there. And, and I'll read through the first chapter. After doing that, after just reading it through, we'll go back and start discussing the components in detail. And I'll do that a number of times if need be until we convert it to how the component parts play out into our psyche, which is what we're going to get to. Okay, what I have found is that in going through the material that you have to define everything that, that is there. And in this case, since I'm going to be using the Bhagavad Gita and starting right off with uh, with Krishna, I want to know about Krishna. And what I learn right off the bat is a little bit of research here that he combined earthly majesty with a hidden spiritual power, earthly majesty, hidden spiritual power. We've got two things going on right there. Remember that earthly majesty, hidden spiritual power. That's actually the physical and the spiritual realm right there. Most know him only as an unimportant prince, but the wise have seen him reveal his power to destroy evil and protect the good. So that is an important part to understand which Hindu god we're taking with us on this trip. There are different Hindu Hindus use a lot of different gods. So like the Greeks and the Romans, lots of gods, lots of adaptations, lots of evolution of what is going on. That's a deeper layer. Let's just stick with what we have going on right now. Okay, so the thing that I want to do now is we, we have a conversation going on. And let me very briefly set up where we are at this point of the story, though, is that before getting here, that Arjuna and his family have land and that the, uh, the uncles, aunts, other people, family members, larger family member uh, members were going to be allowed to use the field for a period of time. And then after that period of time, they're supposed to relinquish it and give it back. And they don't. And so this is where it picks up where Arjuna is needing to go get that land back. He's debating on the battle he's going to have to wage with his family members to get his family's property back. In chapter one, the war within, they didn't obscure that secret very well, did they? The question is asked, O oh, Sanjaya, tell me what happened at, this is where it goes, Karukshetra, the field of Dharma, where my family and the Pandavas gathered to fight. The reply, having surveyed the forces of the Pandavas arrayed, arrayed for battle, Prince yeah, Duryodhana approached his teacher, Drona, and spoke, O oh, my teacher, 
Look at this mighty army of the Pandavas assembled by your own gifted disciple, Yudhishthira. There are heroic warriors and great archers who are the equals of Bhima and Arjuna. And then they have all these other names, the mighty Drupada, um, Drishtaketu, Drishtaketu, Chikatana, the valiant king of Kashi. Anyway, yeah, you see, I don't get these names very well. Great leader, the powerful, the valiant. But these names are very important. We need to, we're going to make, we're going to come back and look at these. In addition to the sons of, so they're, they're all com commanding mighty chariots. So there's, he's got a group of people here that are uh, straight up people ready to go with him. Oh, best of Brahmins, listen to the names of those who are distinguished among our own forces. And then they go through more names and go through kind of a, a list of people here who are there to fight. There's many others too, heroes giving up their lives for my sake. Remember that part right there, giving up their lives for my sake, all proficient in war and armed with a variety of weapons. Our army is unlimited and commanded by Bish Bishma. Theirs is small and commanded by Bhima. Let everyone take his proper place and stand firm supporting Bhishma. Remember, when you're going through things like this, you want to look up all those things. What is Bhishma? What is Bhima? <clears throat> we'll convert them. Then the powerful Bhishma, the grandsire, oldest of all Kurus, in order to cheer Duri, uh, yeah, roared like a lion and blew his conch horn. And after Bhishma, a tremendous noise arose of conches and cow horns and pounding on drums. Then Sri Krishna, Sri Krishna, Lord Krishna, I'll just call him Lord Krishna, and Arjuna, who were standing in a mighty chariot, yoked with white horses, blew their divine conches. Krishna blew the conch named, and as we see that we start seeing that they're blowing conches, and that they have names for the conches, and that... Um, as you look through there, you see the same thing we're looking at, at something that is happening there, but also the conches are creating tones, they're creating frequencies. Just be aware of a few things happening there that we're going to see emerge elsewhere. I'm not going to try to pronounce all of those. What I want to suggest right now is that we're seeing the emergence here of one of those layers. I've mentioned in previous videos that there are layers of things going on that I haven't explored. I can see them. And one of them is that throughout all of the material, there's, there's a lead up of names. There's people that are brought on board. There's groups that are gathered. There's Argonauts that are loaded on ships. There are warriors getting ready to go that all of these seem to represent certain commonalities. Jesus has 12 disciples. They've, they've gathered it down to a smaller group, but that the names represent something in their culture that is a quality that we have in our as, as us as an individual that we need to have with us. We have a certain sense of honor, of righteousness, the, the knowing the right from wrong, of taking a firm stand against something that is not just. Uh, we have fears. We have qualities like that in us that they are identifying through the, the an analogous use of names in their culture that carried that same meaning. And there's a very good reason I didn't pursue those really aggressively in, in a lot of detail is because I was looking for the template and I saw those as component parts that were becoming variable throughout the work, that they were certainly there, but they appeared to me to be things that were, that were very viable, but they were not necessarily something you had to know, that they helped carry the story. They were absolutely accurate. But they made the story bigger and more complex. It made it more rich. It made the story a more fun story to have more parts to it, more things to figure out. That's what I think I see there. The, the reason I say that is because we know ultimately that if we're going to go in and start dealing with our things, do we really need to know, okay, what's that going to take? You're going to have to have courage. You're going to have doubts. You're going to have to have a sense of justice about you. Boy, that's what they're adding in that we can look at and go, okay, yeah, we, we got that. We're already going past that. So I didn't pursue them because that's what I was thinking, that, they, that they're carrying meanings that we probably already know. We just haven't made the connection completely. 
However, that's just me, and I know I haven't gotten very far. I think that there's it's, this material is very rich with a lot of unknown, a lot of unknown information that I see in it. Okay, let's continue to move on with I uh, with this reading, but let's take a look first. What are, what are we? Where are we? We are so far. We are with Arjuna in a chariot, and they are on a battlefield or getting ready to go to battle to go get the land back. Arjun has got people with him that are going to come with him that are, they're all identified as somebody. Find out who those people are. They are making preparation and they are starting now to blow conch shells, make noise, blow horns. The place is starting to rumble and, and get into an uproarious state. That is where we are. Okay, they were naming everybody that was blowing horns, and it goes on. Then King of Kashi, the leading bowman, the great warrior, Sikhandi. Yeah, I don't know those names. Somebody is invincible. All the sons of Drapati, the strong-armed son of Subhadra, joined in. And the noise tore through the heart of someone's army. Indeed, the sound was tumultuous, echoing throughout heaven and earth. Then, O Dhritarashtra, Lord of the earth, having seen your son's forces set in their places and the fighting about to begin, Arjuna spoke these words to Lord Krishna. O Krishna, drive my chariot between the two armies. I want to see those who desire to fight with me. With whom will this battle be fought? I want to see those assembled to fight for Duryodhana, those who seek to please the evil-minded son of Dhritarishtra by engaging in war. Thus Arjuna spoke, and Lord Krishna, driving his splendid chariot between the two armies, facing Bhishma and Drona and all the kings of the earth, said, Arjuna, behold all the Kurus gathered together. And Arjuna, standing between the two armies, saw fathers and grandfathers, teachers, uncles and brothers, sons and grandsons, in-laws and friends. Seeing his kinsmen established in opposition, Arjuna was overcome by sorrow. Despairing, he spoke these words. O oh Krishna, I see my own relations here, anxious to fight, and my limbs grow weak. My mouth is dry, my body shakes, and my hair is standing on end. My skin burns, and the bow Gandiva has slipped from my hand. I am unable to stand. My mind seems to be whirling. These signs bode evil for us. I do not see that any good can come from killing our relations in battle. O oh Krishna, I have no desire for victory or for a kingdom or pleasures. Of what use is a kingdom or pleasure or even life if those who sake we desire these things, teachers, fathers, sons, grandfathers, uncles, in-laws, grandsons, and others with family ties, are engaging in this battle, renouncing their wealth and their lives? Even if they were to kill me, I would not want to kill them, not even to become ruler of the three worlds." How much less for earth alone? O oh Krishna, what satisfaction could we find in killing Drishtarithra's sons? We would become sinners by slaying these men, even though they are evil. The sons of Dhritarashtra are related to us, therefore we should not kill them. How can we gain happiness by killing members of our own family? Though they are overpowered by greed and see no evil in destroying families or injuring friends, we see these evils. Why shouldn't we turn away from this sin? When a family declines, ancient traditions are destroyed. With them are lost the spiritual foundations for life and the family loses its sense of unity. Where there is no sense of unity, the women of the family become corrupt, and with the corruption of its women, society is plunged into chaos. Everybody listening, I'm going to fix that. It's not what it sounds like. This isn't about women. We're going to fix that. It's going to end up okay. 
Social chaos is hell for the family and for those who have destroyed the family as well. It disrupts the process of spiritual evolution begun by our ancestors. The timeless spiritual foundations of family and society would be destroyed by these terrible deeds which violate the unity of life. It is said that those whose family dharma has been destroyed dwell in hell. This is a great sin. We are prepared to kill our own relations out of greed for the pleasures of a kingdom. Better for me if the sons of Dhritarashtra, weapons in hand, were to attack me in battle and kill me unarmed and unresisting. Overwhelmed by sorrow, Arjuna spoke these words, and casting away his bow and his arrows, he sat down in his chariot in the middle of the battlefield. All right, so there he goes in the end. He's despaired and just I don't know what to do. Let's uh, do an overview again. And I'm not going to get into um, the explanation of the story. What I want to do is show the elements in there that I've been talking about. So actually, let's yeah do that. So first of all, we have Arjuna who is in the chariot. His charioteer is his god. Krishna is in a position to drive the chariot and to advise Arjuna, but is not going to be able to pull the bow and do any work for Arjuna. Arjuna is going to have to do all of the work for himself. Okay, and remember, Arjuna's bow was named Gandiva. Um, the bow was forged by Lord Brahma himself, the supreme creator. So this is telling us that the bow comes from the from origins. This is how things work. This is the this is the tool you use. The bow was created from a heavenly tree called the Gandhi. It was about as tall as a palm tree and was so heavy very few people could truly lift it. Besides Arjuna, the ones who were believed to be worthy of wielding it were Krishna, Karna, and it names a few others. So there, there's not very many people that can even use this right here, which is what? That's our where we're few are going to do this. Few can manage this. The bow is the tools that are going to be used to go destroy the offspring. Well, actually, our metaphoric family members coming up that have got our field that are not giving it back. Let's get to that part. Okay, let's go back to the charioteer being Krishna for Arjuna. And they are now, he's gone surveyed up and down, looking at the battlefield. He's He's got friends on his side. He's got people that are in chariots that are blowing conches and, yeah, making sounds. Uh, we've got that separation from the the woman thing again. It's like, where does that come from? We see that actually in Genesis where, uh, yeah, well, I'll get detailed on that a little bit more. And then in the end, he just decides all of this killing my family to get back the land just isn't worth it. It doesn't seem like, um, like that's the right thing to do. There's a lot of... There's a lot of detail in this story. Let's just grab the big pieces. Okay, the five elements as we're going through and looking at the five parts of the psyche. There is, um, first of all, the story, this, the, it's called the, the battle within, the war within. This is, we, we play all of this out inside of us. And all of those pieces of the story are parts of us. They play out in the psyche. So we are... We're Arjuna. We are also Krishna. But what are those parts? Arjuna is going to be our consciousness. Arjuna is the one who is responsible for getting things back. That's the conscious that has to go in and make the choices and do the work and get advisement from our higher self, the God, the supernatural aid is coming in right now. This is teaching us that there's this part of us that's looking up above and saying, you can do this. Look, there's a big picture. I know you're afraid, but come on, th this is a, this is the part of you that is helping you look at what there is right now. The elements that have collected all of these other people are, th are the qualities that you have that you started off in life. The land belonged to you and to your lineage. The land is your peace of mind. It is your life. And before we get to a point in life where we turn inward and say, oh my God, what am I going to do with myself? 
the land belongs to our other family members, the offspring, the things that our life has um, produced that they're calling our family members. And they get so much time to live and then we're supposed to get our life back, but they're not doing it. There's this reluctance of our old self to let go. We're trying to move on from there. So we see a couple of things happening here. The struggle that the conscious is having in facing what those offspring are, knowing that maybe I want to get that back. Maybe I don't. He's, you see he's struggling right here. And uh, the the female split, those are all divisions. This is we have become divided. Our house has become divided within ourselves, but that is our conscious, our subconscious, what we do, what we don't want to do that comes through us anyway. Those things that we don't have control over, the things that cycle through us that we were tired of and just wanting to have a better life uh, in general. I want to point out a couple of random things here that they, they nevertheless fit with the pattern seeking process and it, it kind of works this way. It expands out. It's much easier to see it the more things that you become aware of. The, the fewer things, it's, it's more difficult to see the pattern. It certainly is. So, yeah, if you're looking for it, be, be aware of that. But you can observe it in, in single items. Okay, we have one that we're aware of from antiquity, the flood, um, you know, the flood myth, the flood story. And that appears in quite a few different places. People might claim exclusivity to it, but in reality, what it is, it's a part of this template that is an analog used that is for cleaning out your house. You have where you've kind of like where Arjuna is at this point, except it's a different way to tell the story. You have a, in, instead of having family members that aren't giving your field back, you have a world, your world is full of a bunch of people that are, that need to be gone now. They're, they're sinning that you, you want, you want a fresh start. So it's a purging, it's a cleaning story like that. And we see the similarities. We see the crossover. That's a part of that template that we're seeing right there. Those exist there for a reason as a part of that template. When you look at something like this, a story here, you can see it emerge in other places. Um, Joshua and the walls of Jericho. Remember, he was taking over for Moses. So he's the new element coming on board. There, there's, there's other elements to the story, but you can see a similarity where they're getting together. They're outside the walls of a city instead of a, a field to get back. It, 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 the analog becomes a city that is sinful inside and you're marching around it. Only in this case, instead of holding back, they went ahead and went for it. They went through some rituals. There were some different elements to the story, but the horns are being blown. The things are happening. There's a big raucous roar. People are afraid inside. You see the same elements happening and they are doing that. They're carrying that idea that you're going into this place, your mind, and they're giving it fun stories that fit in their culture, fun carrier stories. You can kind of see those emerge, but they become less easy to spot that they're still part of the template. But when you look at them long enough, you, you, your brain kind of wires to seeing it that way. One pattern I see emergent that doesn't show up everywhere, but it is the, like in this case where they're, they're, they're making sounds, they're blowing horns, blowing shells, doing some kind of noise making from horns. Um, and that appears in a couple of different places, but in the teachings from, um, uh, well, Hermetic teachings and whatnot that where, where they're using different kinds of language. And one of the things they just talk about is frequency. We have to transmute. We have to forgive. We have to change things. And what one of the things, you know, I don't know, are they, is, is this an idea where they're, they're using a frequency to demonstrate the idea of changing a frequency? Maybe it could be just that they're showing intensity, but if this is a part of who and what we are and we're playing it out inside of us, then this is representing that part of us that is like, okay, I'm going after it. I'm going in right now. I'm, I'm, I'm going to tear it down. I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to go through the ritual things. The Bible one has other numbers in there that, that they've got going on in, in Jewish numbering system. Uh, that is something they've got different analogs happening there that are not identical here. So, but, but you can see that the pattern emerges 
And they're, they're changing the ways that they're carrying the similar teachings, though. The threes, the sevens, the things like that are going to be representative of some kind of characteristics or time frame or intensity or something like that. Okay, let me see if I can wrap this up here. Um, let's try to summarize everything. We've got, uh, we've got Arjuna getting ready to go on the battlefield to take his land back, and uh, he needs help. He needs somebody to drive the chariot. So he's got his supernatural help coming in. And, of course, he's got that bow that he can hold. He's, very, he's selected already. He's, he's capable of managing this. We are, we are him. We are capable of doing that. That is a selection process. The bow represents the truth. Um, Krishna represents the God that, that manages the difference between good and evil. But moreover, that that is our higher self, that that is the part of our personality as we're going through the story. This is the part of us that is interacting with our conscious self, with our Arjuna self. Our Arjuna self is the one that's afraid right now, while our other self is saying, you got to do this. So those parts are there, and yeah, the family members are all of the things that we have stored in our psyche that we must now kill that we don't want to go kill. We feel something there. We are now ready to go battle all of the things, all of the family members that have had charge of our life up to a point where we decide now we want it back, and that along the way we have become divided, that whole female split thing is not women being bad it is the conscious it is this is the hierarchy part of what we're looking for in in the material sometimes when they're using something like that they didn't use male and female they just use female but that's going to fit with the idea that our consciousness wants one thing but our our other aspect of us what they're calling the female the subconscious the, the things that we have put away that is simply analogous to that right there. doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman. We have our conscious side that they're referring to as the, the male side in, in this teaching, in, a, in this patriarchal type teaching. And the female is going to be the subconscious that the, that the, uh, that the subconscious became a product of what the, the, the conscious is in charge that's an analog that they're using. It plays out that way in the psyche. It has to. We don't play it out that way in real life. Um, everybody lives life fair, I hope. But that one needs to be understood that that is not about women. That is about the subconscious that is, yeah, that's what we want to get after. That is showing us that that is analogous to the family members that, that don't want to give up the field. And that we are afraid, we don't want to go, we're not dealing with it. We don't want to go do it. So here we have, we're ready to go fight our past. We have been called. We're getting our supernatural help and we're refusing the call. We're getting all the aid and everything right now by just talking about it. But here we go. Boom. There's this part of the template. Plus it's visible in a few other places as well as, you know, as evidenced by the uh, Jericho story. If I was to honestly look at this in its simplest form, what you see right here is that right there where Arjuna refused, that's that's where right at the end of the story, Arjuna said no. But up to that point, we knew, we knew that we had to go take care of whatever business was necessary to, to resolve things. And our higher self was showing our consciousness what we have to do hey you've got to take care of this pain shame and hurt here's what there is ahead this is what your enemies look like there's nothing i can do except show it to you you're going to have to go do it but i can help give you advice along the way and arjuna said Whew, uh, we're divided i don't know what to do i can't fight them i don't want to right now and that's exactly what happened in that story <laughs> And perhaps there's more to them that I just haven't gone and explored yet because my, <laughs> I don't have time. <laughs> anyway, so if you're a seeker and this is what you're looking for, this is the kind of pattern stuff I think that will emerge. You're looking for a lot of different things. Step back from it. Don't get so close to it that you're trying to look at it as reality. Everything is, everything is coded in there. Everything is coded. Find out what those words mean. Find out what those names mean. And then rewrite it 
in that way. Uh, and it'll begin to emerge. And it's, it's just a puzzle. It is. It's just a puzzle. It's visible. But it, take, it does take a while to, to see it. Anyway, I can't think of anything else to do with this video right now. So I hope this helps. If you're seeking, feel free to ask any questions below. And uh, love one another. And I'll see you in the next video.